Hello everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program. Now, today I'm going to be talking about something that I've mentioned in passing, uh, I think a couple of times. See, it's hard to tell what things I've actually talked about and what things are just in my head, literally. Anyways, but I'm talking about antimatter engines and going to Alpha Centauri using them. Now, here I have a little setup of, um, uh, roughly what you'd kind of get. Uh, with the type I'm talking about here, which is a beam core antimatter engine. So basically what you have here is a probe that is like mostly just fuel mass and engine. Very little of it is actual spacecraft. And this is because if you want to get to somewhere like Alpha Centauri in a reasonable time, you have to go very, very fast. I'm just going to spool this up while I talk. And if you want to go very, very fast, you need a lot of, um, well, you need a lot of delta V, but you also need your fuel exhaust to have a very high um, ISP, like specific impulse. Ooh. Actually, let's turn off the gimbal. And there we go. Anyways, so um, with antimatter, you can actually get an incredibly high impulse. Uh, by that I mean you can get exhaust that comes out of the engine that approaches close to the speed of light. And it depends on what you do, actually but a reasonable enough fraction that you can get your spacecraft up to a very, very high speed. Uh, the only problem is getting the fuel you need. Actually, I'm going right to the sun there. Eh, whatever, it doesn't matter. This is just, just, just a demonstration. Actually, where am I going? Eh, it'll be fine. We'll speed up and just swing by the sun. Anyways, but you need to get a lot of antimatter. Now, currently, um, we can make it but it's incredibly inefficient to do, to do so. And in order to make usable amounts, um, we'll need well, infrastructure that we don't have and can't feasibly make. Um, one second, I'm just gonna turn off heat just to make sure, uh, cheats. Ignore max temperature, there we go. Anyways, so another option is you can actually harvest it from nature. Now in this case, I have Jewel, uh, because that's the only gas giant we have in this game, because the developers don't feel like adding new planets, which is sad. But uh, what I'm talking about here is actually Saturn. Now, why Saturn as opposed to, say, Jupiter or Neptune or Uranus? Because um, you can get a lot of antimatter around Jupiter and its um, anti-proton radiation belt. However, with Saturn, not only do you get radiation captured from interstellar space, you also get antimatter captured or generated um, naturally in the system because of cosmic ray interactions with particles in the rings. So you actually have a lot of antimatter in an antimatter, well, anti-proton, I suppose, belt orbiting uh, Saturn. So this idea, which I'd like to point out, is not an original idea by me. I just like building off ideas. It's one that uh, I can't remember which or who came up with it originally, but it's an idea that uh, what you do is you send a space probe out to like one of the gas giants, Jupiter or Saturn, in my case Saturn, and once it's there, it starts harvesting anti-protons from the radiation belt, and this goes on for probably months, um, a long time. And once it has a sufficient amount, then the actual mission begins, where it then lines up its trajectory and all that stuff, and then turns on the antimatter engine, and off it goes. In this case, I've tried to kind of approximate it with uh, two large um, donut tanks, one storing anti-protons, one storing normal protons, and they basically are constantly accelerated into a circle, and then they're shot into the engines in a beam, and once like in a par two parallel beams that go down the engine, and then a magnet compresses them, so they both start, you know, moving closer and closer until they actually meet in the ac in the chamber, and where they meet, they annihilate, and when they annihilate, well, they produce a lot of um, a lot of energy, which is then funneled out the back in the form like magnetic bottles which push everything out and you get very high thrust with very little fuel and you can get to really really high speeds which is what we're going for here uh, only problem is you do get a lot of like neutrino and neutron generation um, through this and you can't well you, you can't really control you can't control neutrinos at all currently and uh, you can't really control neutrons neutrinos, neutrons, yes, both of them. So what you get is you do get a lot of energy lost in the form of neutrinos and neutrons. And the neutrons actually, um, as the engine turns on, the longer the engine burns for, uh, the more radioactive 
the whole engine compartment becomes, just from neutron flux, so, um, which is why the spacecraft is actually far away from the engine, way up here, away from the engine. Now, in this scenario, you you'd want to get to a reasonable um, a reasonable clip. So, I always like to aim for about 50 to 70 percent C, the speed of light, which sounds crazy, but it is actually feasible. Um, it just requires a few things. One thing about antimatter spacecraft is the faster you want to go and slow down, um, the more mass has to be fuel. So to get up to like 10%, 20% speed of light, you can have a fairly reasonable sized spacecraft with a fairly reasonable sized fuel load. However, to get much higher, you need to start pumping in more and more fuel, and you have to make sure that most of your mass is actually fuel and not just, like, parts. So you want your spacecraft to be very, very lightweight, and so its mass is comprised mostly of fuel. Uh, in this case, if you want to get to about 70% speed of light, you would need more than half, I think, uh, percentage-wise percentage of the mass would have to be fuel. So basically the ship would just be two very large and would be very large tanks, a very very small spacecraft and an engine. And then it would just contain a lot of antiprotons and protons in a cloud. And then away it goes. Of course if you just want to go there and do a flyby at relativistic speeds, or even just you know slow down a little bit, you can kind of tweak that a bit. But uh, if you want to like actually go to Alpha Centauri and then settle into orbit around the star system or a planet there, you would need to burn for, I don't know, a few months, a few weeks to a few months to, to, until you get up to your actual speed, and then cut off the engine, and then coast for a 70% speed of light, about six years, and then um, you then turn the, f the ship around, and then you burn for the same amount of time, because it, you know, it takes the same amount of time to speed up, it takes the same amount of time to slow down, basically, and then you kill your velocity and settle into orbit. And once you're there, you're pretty much, you know, it's, it's not coming back. Un unless you have um, fuel there, your ship's not coming back. So this is why we're doing unmanned probes, because, you know, safety-wise. So, yeah, and um, another danger, of course, flying at these speeds, which is relativistic speeds, is impacts. You don't want things to crash into you and kill your spacecraft, because even grains of dust will cause explosions when they hit you, and just atoms will actually erode material. So in this case, I have this variant, where you have a, uh, a shield out front that just basically um, tanks all the impacts and will actually erode slowly. I think it was calculated that like a spacecraft traveling close to the speed of light going to Alpha Centauri, um, it would like, like just through gases through the through interstellar space, it would like erode a few centimeters of material as it went, which is kind of scary if you think about it, but still. So in this case, we're thinking large, um, solid, or maybe even like a lightweight, but something that can erode and ablate and can take impact with a punch and not cause problems. Where are we going? We're going straight that way. How fast are we going? 46 days to get from Jewel to the Sun. Uh, that's pretty cool. Anyways, that, 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 that is one idea. However, it's not the only idea. Right, this is my second version. Um, I, I, <laughs> we're going fast enough that it's going to take only like 20 days to get from Jewel to the uh, orbit of Eve, which is pretty hilarious. So we're just going to like scoot on past here and everything. Come on, faster. Oh, there we go. Love it. Anyways, so now we're out here. Um, this is another idea which has been put forward. Um, it's been kind of tossed around. It was also used in James Cameron's Avatar. But what you have going on here is you deploy thin, usually mylar, um, coverings, I guess you could say, umbrellas and you don't actually leave them attached to the ship. I suppose you could, but in this case, we're going to go this way. Two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four. So in this case, we're going to do this. And what this does is you basically have four or five um, of these large sheets that then kind of float out in front of the spacecraft, and they slowly spread out as time goes on. 
and what they do is they act as basically plows. So in this case, um, the spacecraft is now back here, and we have these sh shades way up front. It also reduces the mass of the overall spacecraft. But how these work is instead of just trying to brute force your way through the interstellar medium, what you have going on here is you have a multi-layer shield, I suppose, of very thin material. And what happens is particles that are big enough to cause issues to the spacecraft will hit these sheets. It'll hit, it'll hit the first one, and the just the, the kinetic the kinetic energy of it will will convert the um, the particle basically into plasma, uh, plasma and just particle showers, which then hit the next sheet and does the same thing, and the next one, and the next one, and it basically removes all the energy from the impact by converting it to plasma and then absorbing the plasma through multiple sh uh, layers. Uh, for larger things like dust grains and stuff that are I guess anything smaller than a dust grain would work great for it. Things like a pebble, um, not very likely to find uh, floating through space, like not likely to hit anyways, but would work kind of well. Things the size of like a boulder, uh, no, it's going to rip through all these and destroy everything. But you're, that's very, very unlikely. So in this case, you can just have these uh, these shields out front that, that just protect the spacecraft as it's on its way. And it's all well and good. You can theoretically keep them attached to the spacecraft and just have them like spool out or tether out and then whatever. But um, either one works. So in this case, you would just have this and they slowly go away. And um, you can also have them powered so they actually have their own um, control systems. And you have them fly out um, a few kilometers in front and then stay in a specific location, like a distance from the spacecraft. Uh, you know, keeping you protected and safe from all these evil space debris, because they are quite evil. Uh, how fast are we going? Oh, there we go. Yeah, not, not as fast as my other ones, but we're going fast enough. That's that. Oh, that's Rodina. Um, that's Ranger 2, and there's Ranger 3. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's coming back in like 500 years. It's Buck Rogers jokes, you know. Anyways, so this is kind of an idea uh, I've been working on based on already, you know, existing science, because, like, some some ideas I have are new and original, however, I like to stick with the, in the realm of reality, so I, I enjoy building off of like, pre-existing ideas, because it gives me a framework of reality to work on, where I, I know that, you know, there's some, some validity to it, instead of, you know, I have an idea to do this, but I don't know what the hell I'm talking about technically, so um, for all I know it could be wrong. Some things are fine, but you know, for things like this, I like to kind of build off of pre-existing ideas, because um, again, there's more validity to it. And I, I, I really love the idea of beam core antimatter engines and uh, probes like this. Of course there's other ways to get to Alpha Centauri uh, with modern technology, such as, um, well, breakthrough star shot using solar sails and lasers. Which, actually, that idea was first put forward by, um, Robert Forward, I think? Yeah, Forward. Only his idea was for a manned spacecraft, and you have a lens the size of, like, the Earth out in, uh, past Neptune, and you sh to keep the laser focused, and it's, yeah. But in this case, we're talking about using a very powerful laser on a swarm of these things, and once they're gone, they're gone. But, yeah. In this case, I'm talking antimatter engines which we don't have yet, but the um, theoretical framework for them does exist. The only problem is getting the fuel for it. Like, the only real problem with the antimatter engine is getting the fuel, and uh, we can probably do that around the gas giants, because making it would be not very easy. Like, theoretically, if we set up, like, massive orbiting space stations that had just massive solar collectors, and they orbited the sun, and were the size of, like, cities, and we're using all that energy to generate antimatter. You could probably get like a gram of antimatter a month kind of thing. Well, I guess depending on the size, like um, one idea, which I think was also put before by was also made by Forward was like you have these massive complexes that orbit the sun and, gener and generate a gram of antimatter a day. But the um, this the sheer amount of infrastructure to do that would be so massive it's not quite practical. If we can get fusion reactors, like really good quality ones. We can probably make that smaller, but for the time being, uh, making usable amounts of antimatter is not really feasible uh, at all. So we're all about collecting it from natural sources, at least I am. 
I actually contacted uh, Deep Space Industries and Planetary Resources and asked them about that. And they're only aiming at volatiles like water and hydrogen and stuff, but whatever. Anyways, so that's what I wanted to talk about was um, this, which is now going to fly off in the middle of, well, space, nowhere. Um, but yeah, it's a fun idea. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see more come of it, but again, I have like no funding and no credibility, and I have to remember that. <laughs> That uh, in the eyes of everyone else, I am just some random guy who um, is probably, you know, knows more than average, but is still not, I don't have a degree or anything, so. Uh, it really sucks, but it's the rules, and I have to follow the rules. Which is why I'm working on other things that don't really require much, like, yeah. Anyways, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll be back with more stuff later. And thank you all for watching. Space.